Recording in progress. There we go. All right, let's kick it off. Uh, so today's training, guys, as I had announced this week, what do you guys think about the announcements? <laughs> Is that better? It works? <laughs> Anybody see the announcements in the bathroom? Uh, <laughs> yeah, we put it in the bathroom, flyers everywhere. Uh, <laughs> it works, it works. Um, so today's training, guys, mastering the listing process A through Z. I signed a listing, what's next? That's what it's called. Um, so this training is really about what happens after you sign a listing. So I'm not gonna teach you how to sign a listing. We've done listing presentation training before. That's a whole separate animal of how to find listings, how to meet the seller, how to get them to commit, to work with you, sign them. This training is, hey, I got the listing signed. Now what's the process to get the listing onto the market, prepped, ready to go, um, making it on there smoothly with as the least amount of hurdles possible and create an experience for your sellers that is, um, is going to be favorable, right? It's going to be a good experience for them. The better experience that they have, the more you're going to look like the rock star, the more they're going to want to refer other clients to you. So it's really all about that process of you sign the listing, all, uh, going and getting it on the market smoothly and having a good experience for the seller. So let's just kind of set the stage for that. Um, before I go into my presentation, why should you listen to me, right? Why does this, anything I say today, why should you take this in consideration? Um, so I was actually having a little fun going on the MLS and I pulled up my sales stats. So some of you guys may not know um, what I've done, but I've sold quite a bit of homes, guys, even though my role today is more coaching and mentoring and building the company. And for the last three years, um, I've been not really doing, you know, in production and selling homes myself. Um, but these are all homes that I've sold. Just going back to MLS, these are personal transactions that were under my, uh, that I was in the negotiations, I was in the transaction. Um, and this is going back all the way through my history of being a real estate agent. And so to total it up at the bottom, $162 million of personal production. These are deals that I've personally closed. Um, number of sell or number of total transactions, 227 transactions that I've personally closed. Out of those 227, 199 of them were listings, right? So about 200 listings, about 28 buyers, right? So the majority of my business has been listing business. Um, through those transactions, I've been able to train people like Blanca, people like Rob that have come with me on the listing appointments and stuff like that and help them build their experience. Um, but it's safe to say your boys sold some homes, right? Yeah. Your boys sold some homes and your boys sold some actual listings, right? Um, not as many buyers. And, and really, really quick guys, because again, I want, I, I just want you to really emphasize because there's there's a big difference of his of Enrique's personal production versus our PRG production. Yeah. Right. So I want to make sure that's extremely clear. And I know you can mention it a few times, but this is personal production, meaning he was on the contract. Yeah. I'm right? on that's, the contract. I'm at the, the I went on the listing. I booked the listing appointment. I went on the appointment. I met with the client. I closed them. I signed them. I sold the commission. I took it from start all the way to finish, closed the deal, collected a commission check. So personal transactions. Then if you add up what the team has done and like all the transactions that I've coached people on, mentored on, there's like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of additional transactions through our team, right? Um, that I've been a part of, but these are all personal transactions. So if you have a question about sellers, guys, come to me, I got you. But with that being said, if you get a seller that you're working on and you're trying to get, build your experience in that, you should be consulting with me on every listing that you get, right? Until you get to a point where you feel extremely confident to handle it on your own, but come to me because if you're running into an issue, I probably ran into it before, right? Now, um, am I going to say that I've done a phenomenal job on all 200 of those listings? No, because I had to start somewhere, right? My first listing probably sucked, right? I didn't know what the hell I was doing or I knew a little bit, or I knew enough to get the listing, but when you do 200 listings, you're going to learn some things along the way and you're going to get better and better and better, right? There's so, many fights. 
been a lot of fights. Uh, and those are the ones I closed, right? I'm not showing you the ones that I listed and they fell through or they expired or they canceled or whatever. There's a bunch of those too, right? When you sell 200 listings, you're going to have a lot that were unsuccessful. Um, but the majority of mine were successful, right? So um, I've also learned a lot from those ones that didn't make it to the finish line as what well. What would you say that was maybe 10%? I know it's really quick. Just give you an idea. Maybe 10% of that? Maybe I don't know. Yeah, 10, 20%, yeah. maybe, right? Um, a lot of it had to do with some of them were short sales, you know, in the early days. Some of them were just, you know, I took on unrealistic sellers, stuff like that. And those are the things I'm going to talk about today. Um, and so let's, let's kick it off, guys. Um, so here's what we're going to go over. Here's what we're going to cover. Number one is establishing the right selling plan for your seller, right? What's the plan that you're going to pitch them? What's the plan that you're doing with your seller? Um, crossing all your T's before you move over, right? Before you move forward with the file. You want to make sure you cross certain things off the box before you choose to take on these clients. Um, managing the home preparation. Every home needs to get pre prepared for the market. Some of them, you're doing a little bit of prep. Some of them, you're remodeling. Some of them, you're staging. There's all kinds, there's, you know, everything in between. But how do you manage that effectively, right? So that it's smooth and you avoid as many headaches as possible. Um, we're going to talk about marketing and media day, right? When it's time to now get the photos done, staging done, some of the do's and don'ts that you, you need to uh, know about. Um, and then going on to the market, right? you got the house ready. Now you want to go on the market. How do we get it on the market as smoothly as possible? Um, once it's on the market, how do you manage that listing, that active listing in the best way possible so that your client has a good experience as well? We're going to talk about title and escrow, what their roles are in the transaction, and things, you know, their main purpose and, and the things that you need to be aware of. And then the last part is what could go wrong, right? It's great to know what can go wrong because when you know what can go wrong and you can try to avoid as many of those things as possible, right? Um, so this is a lot, a lot of info just here in its own. Um, this isn't like, how do you negotiate multiple offers? You know, all that other stuff that happens. That's a whole another separate training. This is like, I signed the listing, let's get it onto the market up until we start trying to receive some offers, right? And then feel free to ask any questions at any time. I wanna make sure this is also interactive. I'll be doing a lot of the talking, but if you raise your hand and ask questions, it's gonna make it useful for everybody else. All right, establishing the right selling plan, right? So these are the things that you need to be taking consideration when you're sitting down with the seller and you're trying to figure out okay, what's the plan? How are we going to get this home to market, right? Because there's different ways. There's some people that just, you know, put a sign in front of the yard and slap it on the market and you're selling the house as is. Um, we never really do that. We want to make sure we prep the home in some sort of way to make it the most attractive and get top dollar. Um, but you got to ask and really find out what is the goal of the sale and why are they selling, right? Those are two really, really important things because if you don't know that, and you're not locked in and you guys aren't on the same page, there's no point in moving forward at all with this listing because you will waste a bunch of people's time. You will waste money. You will give yourself a lot of headache and then you will look like an idiot at the end if that if you weren't in line with that, right? So what are some of the reasons that people sell, right? What would you say what are the primary reasons people sell their home? Moving. They're what? Moving. Moving, right? Out Moving out of state, right? What was that? Divorce, Divorce right? They got to split up the assets. What else? Yeah. Upgrade, right? Dog. Death. What was that? Oh, if they get a dog, they need a they need a uh, a bigger space, a bigger yard, right? So those are all those are all reasons why people sell, right? But you need to know that, right? Because you need to know what the motivation is of the client. Because if you know what the motivation is, then you can kind of remind them throughout the process when things get stressful of, hey, this is why we're selling, right? Because what happens is people decide to sell. It takes a long time for them to decide to sell. Um, when they finally decide to sell, you know, in the beginning, like they're motivated, right? They're excited. Maybe they got the job offer. Maybe it's because of divorce or something, but they know they need to sell and the motivation's there. But then what happens is all the work starts to happen. All the different moving parts of the sale happen. And then they start forgetting why they even did this in the first place. And they start focusing on all the stressful parts of the transaction, right? And by the end of it, it's like, I don't even know why I'm selling or they're questioning whether this was the good move or not. So it's important that you ask those questions in your listing presentation. It's important that you ask those questions even once you sign the agreement. 
it's important before you start any of the work on the property that you kind of reiterate and go over that with them of what's the goal of the sale and why are you selling? Now we talk about goal of the sale. Um, what's the goal of every sale of a home? Make the most money. Make the most money? Okay, that was a setup. That was a trick question, okay. right? <laughs> that's, the, that's the normal, what comes to your mind, right? Is the goal is to make the most money. But in fact, that, that's not the goal for everybody, right? For some people, make a fair price and maybe have it be an easy transaction, right? For some people, it's like, no, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. I don't care if I got to knock this house down and rebuild it. I want every freaking penny from this house. There's some people like that. For some people, it's like, hey, I want to do the easiest way possible. And as long as I get at least this amount, which is a fair price, then I'm selling, right? So it's not the goal of every single seller to make the most money, right? And that's important that you understand that because sometimes we think that's the goal and then we're pushing that agenda the whole time. And then the seller is looking at you like, oh, you're forcing me to do things that I don't want to do, right? So it's important that you're on the same page of, hey, this is the goal. And then when you need to push, you can remind them, right, of why you need to push, right? So thanks for participating, Andre, on that trick question. Um, what's important to the seller, right? What's important to the seller is an important question because like we said, the goal could be different, but then there's also certain things that different sellers expect from you, right? Um, what do you guys think is important to a seller when choosing an agent? Communication. Communication transparency. Transparency. Trust. trust how you're going to market the home. Those are all reasons, right? Those are all great reasons, but I can tell you, I can tell you that all of those reasons are not the same for every seller either. Like how you're going to market the home. It's great that you brought that up. Some sellers don't even care about marketing, mm -hmm. right? Some sellers don't see the value in marketing. Some people shop at Walmart. Some people shop at Trader Joe's. Some people shop at Whole Foods. Some, some people shop online, right? Like there's different reasons why people do different things. So sometimes when, we, when we're trying to like push these agendas once again, like, hey, we're going to do all this crazy marketing, this wine and cheese, and we're going to do all this stuff. Some sellers don't care about that or they don't see the value in that, right? So that's where it goes back to make, making sure you have the right sales plan that matches what the seller is willing to do, what the seller expects, and what's in line with their goals and why they're selling. Yeah, one, one thing that, that I see is sometimes the, the listing agent will want to push like all these upgrades and remodel on a property. And that's not what the seller wants. The yeah. seller just wants to get out of the house, mm -hmm. right? So, so again, I think it's important to understand that because you might say, hey, we're going to get you more money and we do this, this, and that. But the seller doesn't even want to do all that. They just want to get, get rid of the house. Exactly, right? right? And you'll see that when it comes to like dealing with older sellers, right? Some older sellers cannot tolerate a remodel on their house, right? That's a lot of work, right? When someone's trying to remodel the house. So the next, the next thing to consider is what can the seller handle and are they realistic, right? So I've had sellers where I'm like, man, if you want, the seller wanted top dollar, but in order to get top dollar, we need to remodel their house. But the seller had nowhere to go and they need to live in the property. And I'm like, dude, there's no way I could remodel this house with you living in the property. It's just going to be too uncomfortable, right? And then if you have like an older seller, right? Who's like already has challenges with, with their age and stuff like that, that's going to be even more difficult. So you need to make, you need to keep in mind what can the seller handle? Um, how much marketing needs to be done? Uh, and is that going to be, is that going to make sense overall in the big picture for the seller, right? Um, or do we make it a little bit easier and compromise and say, hey, we're not going to do all this, but I do need to tell you that maybe your price might be in this range, right? And then you give the seller the options, right? And then you also look out for the seller as well. So like we went on a listing appointment recently, Jason and I, and they're older sellers. They've been living there for 30 plus years. And we talked about a remodel and they ask, you know, will we still be able to live here? And like, there's some people that I was like, yeah, you can still live here. Like we'll tarp off half the, half the house. You stay over there. We paint over here. But I'm like, these people are older. You don't want to be smelling paint fumes. You don't want to be doing all this stuff. And we, so we're like, dude, you're, it's not, it's not going to make sense. Like there's no way you're going to stay here while we remodel it. Right. So we had to t tell the seller, like, that's not really an option. Like, we wouldn't be looking out for you if we had you go down that path. Does that make sense? Um, is the home vacant or occupied? 
that makes a huge, huge difference in what you can do, right? If the home is vacant, well, then you can work all hours of the day. If you're doing a remodel, the seller's not there every day watching what happens, right? Um, there's more um, room to cover up any mistakes that happen if it's vacant, just being quite honest, right? When you have a seller that's there, they are watching every little freaking thing that you're doing. Who's coming to my house? Did you guys leave the lights on? Did someone use the bathroom? I was looking at your flyers. You spelled something wrong, right? Like, because they're there every single day, right? So they're like, you're under the microscope with the seller if it's occupied. So you need to take that into consideration. Like, hey, I know this home's occupied, which means I got to double check everything. I, ha I have less room for error because it's going to come up and I'm going to look back, right? Or vacant, hey, you know, I'll, I'm not going to check every day. Maybe I might go check every few days on what's happening with my listing. Um, establishing a realistic timeline, right? This is where we got, when we sit down with the clients, we want to map out what is the timeline to get their home on the market, right? And you want to err on the side of having a cushion and having a buffer, right? It's better to go worst case scenario and add a little bit of extra time because I will tell you, 90% of the time when you list a home and you're, especially when you're doing remodels and stuff like that, there are always delays, right? Because you're dealing with multiple third parties. You're dealing with the contractor, you're dealing with the vendors, you're dealing with the stagers, the inspectors, you're dealing with all kinds of different people. And there's many, many things that are out of your control. So why over promise something that we know is most likely going to have some sort of delays and it's not going to be an exact, you know, recipe or formula, right? So you might as well establish a timeline that's a little bit longer. And you say, hey, if we finish sooner, great. But let's, you know, I think it's going to take two months to get your home ready, but I'm going to add an extra two weeks because we already know life happens. You may need more time, right? They may not be ready to move out, right? So it's better to have that buffer and not try to be too aggressive on your timeline. Um, your role versus your team's role, right? Um, so if you're a solo agent, you're doing all of this stuff by yourself, right? It's a lot of stuff, right? If you have a team like we do, right? Where we have an, uh, uh, admin support, listing coordination and stuff like that. Your team is able to handle a lot of this stuff for you. So if you're a solo agent and you're doing it all on your own, like it all falls on you, right? You have to be the project uh, manager, the coordinator, the marketer, the agent. You have to be all these different roles. And that can be a lot. And that can really, really slow down your business if you are trying to do everything, right? Because we already know what happens is you start putting your attention over here and then you stop prospecting and stop working on new business. And then boom, next thing you know it, that listing took you two months to get on the market. Your business dropped within those two months, right? Um, when you have a team, then you can lean on your team. You can have them do things for you. You can create leverage within your business so that they can handle a lot of those tedious tasks for you. And your job is to more be the quarterback, right? That doesn't mean you just let it go, but you're the quarterback, right? Like they're handling stuff for you, but you're checking in, you're making sure it's happening and stuff like that. Um, setting the right expectations is extremely important, right? And it kind of sums up all of this stuff, right? Is setting the right expectations when before you move forward um, with you know starting the listing process is you just need to make sure that your seller knows exactly what they're getting themselves into. They need to know what to expect from the transaction. They need to know who's handling what. Um, they need to know what your process is like, right? All those things need to be set up front so that you avoid uh, confrontation or you avoid stuff that's going to come up later, right? It's better to get it all out on the table in the beginning and have the expectations set of what's going to happen. And that's also going to show the seller that you run your business you know, a lot more organized, right? Like you've done this before. It's going to give them more confidence when you can set expectations from the beginning. Um, and then the last thing for this slide here of establishing the right selling plan is you need to take ownership of your listing. Remember, this is your listing. If you sign the listing, the seller is relying on you. Sure, you may have a team. Sure, you may have partners. Sure, you may have vendors. But at the end of the day, every single person that's involved in your transaction, if it goes bad, it falls back on you because you're the agent, right? So this is where you need to take ownership of your listing. You don't just set it and forget it, right? Yes, even on our team, mistakes happen all the time. They're, they're human, right? Like I said, nothing ever goes perfect. 
but you need to make sure you take ownership when something's going wrong. You need to make sure you're watching out. You need to make sure you're constantly checking on your listing, right? And you need to be that second set of eyes, right? To make sure nothing slips through the cracks. And if it does, then you need to address it right away, right? Um, any questions on establishing the right selling plan? Those of you guys that have done listings so far, does any of this resonate with you? <laughs> right? You had you had one, you had one, you had one, right? So I see you guys smiling when I'm talking about this. Is this the, let me ask a question to the audience. So like, is this... Does this help when you guys are going into your listing I mean, now that some of you that have experience, does this kind of open up a, like or show you like a path of things that you might have adjusted or made a little do a little different? Look at mine. Mine's different. What do you think, Mike? Is there anything that you by looking at this? What's one takeaway from yeah, this, Mike? Yeah. What's one takeaway from this right here? <laughs> okay, just one, just one. There you go. So at identifying if the seller is truly motivated, right? What can the seller handle? Are they realistic, right? All those things come into, that's really important, right? Um, good stuff. Okay, let's move forward, guys. Got a lot of stuff to go over. Okay, crossing all your T's. So before I move forward with the listing, I signed the listing, great, I'm excited. But before I move forward at all, number one, are all the sellers on board and ready to sell? Because sometimes you may have a husband and wife and the wife wants to sell and the husband kind of signed, but he's not really fully wants to sell. That's going to bite you in the ass later on, right? So I'd rather have that conversation up front. Hey, uh, you know, Mr. Smith, I sense that you don't really want to sell, right? And I would just flat out say it. It seems Mrs. Smith is ready to make a move, right? And go move out of state with the rest of the family. But I see some hesitation for you. Let's talk about that. Let's get that out in the open and let's make sure we're all on the same page, Mr. Smith. Is that fair? Boom. And by you having that conversation, right? You're going to figure out what their concerns are, what his concerns are, anything. Maybe he wants to sell, but he wants to make sure certain things happen, right? So it's better to have that conversation up front so you can readjust expectations. Maybe you can deliver what he's asking for. Maybe you can't, right? But if there's more than one person on title, you need to make sure like you've had feedback from each person, right? Because otherwise later on, when you've done all this work and you got offers on the table and that person wasn't motivated to begin with, your time, you're, you're done, right? Like your time's wasted. They're going to find every reason not to take an offer that you got on the table. They're going to find every reason to complain about the photos, the staging, the marketing, the work on the property, the open houses. They will complain your ass to death and you're going to be like, dude, why did I take this freaking seller on? Right. And that's because you didn't do a good job of making sure everybody was on board in the beginning. Right. Sometimes we're just like, I got a listing, right? Let's get it. Let's make it happen, right? Yeah, ring the bell, post it on social media. Yeah, listing king. Yeah, what's up, all right? And then like, really, you got like a half a listing, right? <laughs> like you didn't get like, not everyone's on board, right? Um, does the seller know how much they're going to net on the property? They need to know how much they're going to walk away with from the beginning, right? And these are mistakes. I made the mis this mistake before too, where I kind of did like, some like a uh, pen and paper, like gave them a rough idea, you know, but I should have given them a net sheet in the beginning and had them sign it. Right. And I should have gave them the worst case scenario, you know, maybe best case scenario, but definitely worst case scenario. So make sure they know exactly how much they're going to walk away with on the worst case scenario. Right. Because then everything after that is gravy. Right. And you look like a rock star if you made them more money, but they need to know how much they're going to walk away with because a lot of sellers even though sometimes it's basic math, they think a million bucks and they forget that they owe 400,000 on their home, right? Or they forget that they have to pay taxes or they forget that there's commissions that need to come out, right? And then they're thinking like, 
a hundred a million minus four hundred thousand, I get six hundred thousand, right? <laughs> and you're like, no, there's about you know eighty grand worth of fees in there, right? So if it's not spelled out clearly and they don't sign like agreeing to it, you're gonna run into a problem later, right? So I don't move forward at all until I make sure like they're on board with the net, right? Um, this is a big one right here. Does the seller know what their tax implications are? A lot of agents don't even know what taxes are paid on a property when it's, when it's being sold, right? Um, because it's complicated, right? There's certain things that come into play. Is there capital gains? Is there not capital gains? Do you get to exclude 250, 500? Like there's all these questions, right? And we're not tax experts. So number one is you need to understand how taxes work, right? Because that makes you more valuable, but they also got to go see a CPA and they got to understand how much they're going to have to pay in taxes, especially if it's a seller who's lived in their property for a long time. Because they may think, hey, I'm walking away with all this money, but Uncle Sam's going to come take a big chunk of that, right? And if they're already planning their next move, thinking they got 100 or 200 grand more in the bank, and that's really going to go to Uncle Sam, screwed, right? Or they find out later after the sale, they're going to come back and they're going to be pissed off. Right. So remember, most people only sell a home maybe one time in their life. They're not experts at this. Right. You, they need to know how much they're going to pay in taxes. Um, what's happening after the sale? What's the next move? Right. That needs to be all ironed out, sorted out, written down, agreed upon. Are they moving somewhere? Are they renting? Do they need a rent back? Um, are they buying another property, right? If they are, are they approved for financing? Do they know where they're going to go? Um, have they already started identifying homes? Like all those things come into play because remember, like if the next move is not secure, then this move is not going to be secure, right? So you need to already start thinking what's going to happen next and get that ironed out first before you start running with the sale of their home, right? Most people that are selling a lot of them are going to buy another home or they're going to move out of state, maybe buy something cash, maybe move here locally, upgrade, right? They might need financing. The rates are changing, right? So those are all questions that need to be answered up front. They need to know worst case scenario, what their budget is, how much they can expect. And all the numbers that you're quoting them need to be conservative numbers, worst case scenarios, so that they can plan accordingly. If they get more money or if the rate ends up going lower or whatever that might be, that's a bonus, right? But if not, and they were banking on buying another home and then they find out they don't qualify or the rate's 1% higher or they didn't know they had taxes and they thought that money was going to go towards a new home, now you're screwed, right? And so these are all things that can kill your sale, right? Um, here's another one. And I'll tell you a quick story. Are there any major defects with the property? Sometimes we walk into a home, yeah, it looks like an average home, looks cool. Uh, we don't know what's going on behind the walls. We don't know if the termites are holding hands, right? And keeping the property up. We don't know what's up with the foundation. I had a sale that I got, it was from, it was an expired listing. Took a long time, closed the deal, got it staged, marketed, everything. We did inspections, right? It was an older home. Um, our inspection said that there was a little bit of stuff going on with the foundation, but not major. We got into contract, got a great price. And then the buyer brought out this like structural engineering company, right? To check the foundation. And they came back with like a hundred thousand dollar foundation bill, right? You think that killed my sale? <laughs> Hell yeah, it did, right? <laughs> because now they were trying to negotiate, right? And, and the seller was willing to negotiate a little bit, but she wasn't about to give up like 50, 75 grand on her house, right? Uh, she was like, in that case, I just won't sell. And here I am like eight weeks in already from all the prep, everything, thinking I got a slam dunk listing. I'm doing my videos in front of the house. Come check out my new listing. I host the open house. I negotiate multiple offers. And then boom, major defect with the property that killed the sale, right? So part of that was my rookie move because when I saw the stuff on the foundation report, right? If I saw a little bit of stuff on the foundation, I should have went and hired maybe someone else to understand how bad was the foundation work, right? I should have understood how much it was gonna cost truly. Was was that buyer's bid high? It was high. They found like this expensive company, good negotiating, right? 
but I should have known already what I was getting myself into. And I should have already had the seller prepped for that before we went to market. Right. Because it's a lot easier to address that up front and say, Hey, Mrs. Seller, it's going to be about 75 grand to fix this. So are we going to adjust the price or are we going to give a credit or what are we going to, or what are we going to do? Are we going to fix it? How do you want to deal with this? Because this is going to come up. Right. And so I kind of just overlooked it, went forward, and then that bit me in the ass later on. Um, what are the market conditions, right? Where's the market headed right now? Extremely important. Is the market going up? Is it going down? If the market's going up, that's always in your favor, right? Because if I'm selling a home right now, I end up getting more offers. I end up getting a higher price. You look like the rock star. And for uh, the last few years when the market was continuing to go up, up, up at record levels, Every freaking listing agent was the rock star, right? Remember everyone's social media posts, like a hundred offers, 700 grand over asking who you work with matters, right? Like you got to have a negotiator on your side. That wasn't them negotiating. That was the fucking market, right? Like the market was making every listing that you had sell way over asking. And then people were just trying to take credit for that, right? Now, what do we have? We have like the rates went up. Some areas still hot. Some areas prices are sitting, uh, homes are sitting for a little while. So you need to know what's happening, right? And you need to be able to prep your seller if the market is trending downward, right? If it's trending downward, then you need to already kind of have that adjustment made up front or already kind of lay that out when you meet them before you take the listing on. Like, hey, I know the comps say a million, but if we see it's gone down the last three months, if you want to list in three months, it could be down to 900,000 right? Or 950. So I just want to prep you for where we're at, right? And so it's better for us to set those expectations up front. And then the last thing right here on crossing all your T's is does the seller know worst case scenario? Worst case scenario, uh, we sell, you know, on the lower end, this is how much you're going to net, this is how much you're going to walk away with, things don't go in our favor. What is worst, worst case scenario seller? And if you got that, are you okay with that? Can you still make your move? I'm not saying that's what you're going to get. I'm going to try to shoot for the stars. But if for some reason we land on the moon, is that good? Does that work for you? Does that allow you to go from point A to point B? Does that allow you to buy your next home? Right? So these are all things that you got to cross off before you move forward with all this work that we're going to do to get the home listed. And so I'm spending a lot of time on, on this because all of this work up front is really the most important part of the transaction, right? Everything else, if you do all of this right, then it goes smooth towards the end, right? So the majority of the work happens in the beginning. Any questions on crossing your T's or can anybody relate to any of this stuff right here? Feedback, crossing all your T's, yes. For taxes, so um, you found that like it's yeah, for sure. So you always want to have a CPA, um, a tax preparer, CPA, right? Someone who is, is a professional in that field. We have several on, on, in our contact list, but it would be good for you guys to go out there and build contacts as well, because they can also give you referrals, right? And so I have CPAs that I work with. Well, they'll call my seller and they'll just kind of over the phone, give them some free information and give them a rough idea. Or my CPA, I, I can text them or email them. Hey, this is how much they bought the house for. This is how much it's going to sell for. Uh, this is roughly how much they're going to make. Roughly, what would their tax situation be? And they'll tell me, hey, you're probably going to pay about 30% in taxes on this amount. Plus or minus, they may owe 100 grand in taxes. And then I can use that figure and kind of meet with my seller and say, hey, this is a rough amount. I'm not a tax expert. This came from my tax guy. You should go talk to your tax guy, but I just want to give you a ballpark of where you might be to see if it even makes sense for us to keep talking, right? And I've done that and I've had sellers tell me, yeah, it's not going to make sense because I need at least this much because I want to move out of the area and I want to buy a house cash. And if I don't get at least this much, right? It doesn't make sense for me to move. So boom, all right. No point in moving forward, right? Even though I can try to close you, there's no point in me moving forward with this deal because financially it's not going to make sense, right? So the only way to change that is, hey, homes are still appreciating in value. Maybe we need to stay in touch. Maybe by next year, you'll be at a point where it makes sense to stay in touch. And then the seller is going to respect you for that, right? Because most people are just trying to close the seller, right? Yeah, I, I understand like you're looking out for the, for the seller. 
Right. Yeah. In that situation, would you try to recommend like a 1031 on the other home? So to avoid the taxes. So it's great that you brought that up. A 1031 exchange, right? Because there's also a lot of misconceptions. A 1031 exchange only applies to investment property, right? So a lot of a lot of agents don't fully understand how the tax works. And also because the tax law changed like some years back, um, it was a little bit different before, like you could sell a home. And then as long as you buy another home within a certain amount of time, you can like transfer, transfer, I guess, the equity within avoid taxes. That was like maybe 10 plus years ago. And then they changed it to where now, if it's your primary home uh, as an individual, you get to keep 250,000 of the equity. If you're married, they get 250. So it's 500,000 on your primary, right? So some sellers that I talk to that are older, they still think it's the old way. Well, hey, if I just sell this and transfer it over here, I don't have to pay taxes, right? And I'm like, no, you are going to have to pay taxes. And then 1031, that's for investment property only, right? So if it's a rental property, you can sell it, upgrade to a, a bigger rental property, something of higher value, and then you can transfer your equity and avoid paying taxes. There's all kinds of rules and yeah. stuff that come with how you do that. So it right? can't be a primary residence. Primary residence, no. 1031 is only for investment property. And so it's, it's number one, it's important that you learn that, right? The basics of it. Um, so that you don't misquote people. And then also we have a 1031 specialist that we work with. So if you ever have a question, he's really, really good. He's like been in the industry for 30 plus years. Ron Ricard, shout out to him. He'll call your client and he'll run through it with them over the phone. And then if they want to do it, he handles all that part of the transaction. You have to hire this third party company, right? So it's good to have all those things, those tools in your belt, right? Any other questions, guys, before we move on on this? Okay, so we went through a lot of the hard part, right? Like we established everything, we're on the same page, we know worst case scenario, we crossed all our T's. All right, now we gotta get the home ready, right? And so managing the home prep. So some things to consider when you're managing the home prep. Um, we already figured out which plan we're doing, right? Are we just selling the home as is? Are we staging it? Are we remodeling? Like you need to already know that. Um, working with the seller to prep the home, right? So the seller needs to pack all their stuff, right? Um, even if the seller plans to live there, we're still probably going to be decluttering, depersonalizing, packing stuff, making it look as nice as possible, right? Even with the seller living there. And that's a whole project in its own right there, right? So you need to make sure that the seller knows what you want them to do, right? This is where you're going to go in, Maybe you bring your stager out. Maybe you go in just with the game plan. But like I've sold homes where the seller still lives in the property and they had nice furniture. So we're like, hey, we don't need a stage. Like your guys' stuff looks really nice. But all the kids' toys, like we got to get rid of those, right? Like all the pictures on the walls, we got to get rid of those, right? And so having that conversation with them, you got to say it in a nice way, but you got to you gotta present it in a way where like, we got to prepare your home for market. How are we going to market your home the best? Um, and we got to let them know like, hey, everyone's looking at your home when they come in for the open house, like they're looking at what's on the walls or looking at what's on the counters, all those different things. So you need to work with your seller to get the home to look as nice as it can. If the seller plans on staying there. And then sometimes we'll have like partial staging happening where we're going to work with some of their furniture. We might move some stuff around. We might add some pillows some flowers some you know, artwork or whatever it might be, but it needs to stay looking nice. Even if they're living there. Right. I've had situations where we did that. And then like they have kids and like the kids just trash everything. Right. And then we, sh we show up to do the open house and like the house is just all in shambles. Right. Like, you know, so, but you need to factor that in, right? Like if you're going to do an open house, that needs to, that conversation needs to be had up front with, Hey, this is a checklist of things that you need to do. If you plan on living there. Um, I had a seller that lived in her house for 30 plus years. And so she was very emotional seller. And when I went in there, I was, she had dogs, the dogs pissed everywhere, right? She had big dogs. So there was hair everywhere. There was piss everywhere. They pissed through the floor, through the hardwood floor. It went into the subfloor. And so like one of the rooms was like the piss room, right? Like if you have dogs, you already know sometimes dogs will find a spot and then they keep going back to the same spot. Right. And then you go in there and I'm like, I had to tell her, but she was used to it because she lives there, right? So like when you live there, you, you get used to the smell, right? Um, and so I had to tell her like, 
uh, hey, like, we're going to have to address this, right? Because as soon as you walk in, like, it's noticeable. You can smell it. Like, you see the hair. And she was, I had to say in a way where she wouldn't get offended, right? And she was a very, very emotional person where she had to sell. She knew she had to sell, but she was kind of like fighting and screaming and kicking the whole way, right? So getting her to pack her stuff, she was crying every time I would go there, right? The lady was crying. Um, when I told her something about her dog, she would get upset with me, right? But then after she would calm down and then she would apologize to me. I'm sorry. This is just very emotional. I had to hug it out with her a couple times, right? I had to like tell her like, hey, look, I'm, you know, I'm trying to help you. You asked me to do a job. Like I had to come from a, a place of, you know, tapping into the emotional side and, and, you know, so that was a difficult process, honestly. And, um, and in the end, she still found the reason to be upset with me, even though I got her like 200 grand over the asking price. Right. And it was because of the emotions. Like she'd lived there for so long and it was such a hard process for her. Um, just any little thing would like set her off. Right. So you got to keep that in mind when you're working with a seller, especially if they've been there for a long time, especially if they're older, it's an emotional process to go through 20 years, 30 years of stuff that you got to now get rid of or part ways with. Um, any questions on that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, who can't say we're not gonna say that on this recording, but yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think the whole point is, guys, is is you need to let the seller know that you're on their side, that you're on their team, right? And you need to you need to be able to listen well, you need to be able to communicate well, you need to find um the same commonalities, you need to match, you know, the tone and all that stuff that is comfortable for them. So that they see that we're a team here, right? We're trying to accomplish this thing because for a lot of sellers, selling is a, is a highly emotional decision, right? Think about it. Like the lady would cry because we were, she was packing a room and she's like, my kids like st first started walking here, you know? Um, you know, my daughter fell right there and like scraped her knee and I had to get stitches, you know, like this, how like the kitchen burnt down before and I had to rebuild it. Like, like stuff like big life, you know, life moments that uh, as, as they're like going through the packing and stuff, they all start coming up. They start remembering, they forgot about these things and they start remembering as they're going through boxes and stuff in the attic and all these things. And um, yeah, it's, it could be a lot, right? Yeah. 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 And so you may have sellers that like try to change their mind, right? Like I can't do this. Right. I'm not selling. They see the sign go up and like, that's, that's when it hits, right? Like it's reality sets in the sign is up in front of the yard. And now they're like, did I do the right thing? Right. So you gotta be like, you know, just very sensitive with, with sellers, especially, you know, sellers who've been there for a long time. Um, Okay. Working with the contractor. So now you're dealing with the seller, right? And then if you have a contractor that you're working with, that adds a whole nother layer of complication, right? And it also depends, like, is the house vacant? Is it occupied? If there's work being done and, and the seller still lives there or the seller still at the property a lot, they're going to be looking at every freaking little thing that the contractor does, right? So how do you... Um, how do you manage that, right? As smoothly as possible. Let me just tell you, number one, it's hard to manage it hundred percent smooth, right? Cause like you're all, it's not like you're there every day, like with the hammer, helping them remodel the house, right? Like you're checking in, you're going off their word, the contractor's managing their team. So you need to manage the contractor, right? And this is what has worked really well for me is when I meet with my contractor, I kind of lay down the law and I kind of lay down the expectations that I have for them. I let them know about the seller, like, hey, we're dealing with the type of seller who is this way or that way or whatever, or expects this or expects that. Um, hey, just keep in mind, like, they're going to be, they're retired and they're going to be here probably every day checking on your work, right? So your guys that you bring, you know, they need to be doing this or that, right? Or you need to be cleaning up after yourself or whatever it might be. So you need to make sure that there's clear, clear communication with the contractor if they're doing work on the property. Do not just expect like the contractor to know everything because the contractor is not in those appointments with you, right? They're not knowing, 
what the seller's gripes are, concerns are, or expectations are. This is your job to relay that. And then it's your job to manage the contractor, right? So if work is happening, we have a team that does some of the management for you, but I would still go out there. Even though I had a team that was managing my listings, right? I would still go to my listings every week while they were being worked on, right? I would just show up at random times. You know, it make it also make for cool content, right? I'd shoot videos while I'm there. Hey guys, I got this new listing coming up. Hey, we're doing some renovations, check it out. You know, and then I would be there and I'd be checking the work. And then when I leave the property, I call my contractor, even though my admin probably already is in touch with the contractor, even though she went to the property, I also can't expect my admin to be an expert, right? The person who's the expert out of all of this is the agent, right? So I'm checking my admin's work. I'm checking my contractor's work. And then I'm calling the contractor. Hey, the house looks messy, man. Like you got to clean this up. My seller's going to be coming by. You can't leave a bunch of trash everywhere, right? Or hey, I know you have your workers there. I know they're working hard, but they can't be drinking beer at the house, right? Like stuff like that, right? I mean, it, it just happens, right? You go to a construction site, end of the day, you know, they might crack a beer open or whatever. It is what it is, right? But there's, you know, like when stuff could slide and when stuff can't slide, right? And that's up to you to manage that. Um, or if you already kind of see like, hey, you guys are painting things the wrong color. Like, don't wait till they already painted the whole house. Like you need to call that out right on the spot, right? So this is where like you need to be involved and that's where the taking ownership comes into play. That's where you need to make sure you're managing because it's not like a buyer transaction where a buyer transaction, all the work happens when you're like, you're showing them the homes, you're writing the offer, you're negotiating all this stuff with the listing. You're doing all this work just to get it on the market and then hope that the offers come in that you want and hope that you're able to negotiate a good price, right? And hope that the seller is happy with the result. So it's a lot of project management in the beginning to be a listing agent, right? So you need to make sure you understand that. It's my job to make sure this thing goes to the finish line. And when things come up, I call them out right away and I address it with whoever I need to address it with. Um, so that's how you'll keep things on track, right? That's how you will uh, make sure it moves as smoothly as possible. That's how you'll catch things before they happen. That's how you'll be able to correct things as they come up because Anytime you're doing repairs, there's going to be stuff that comes up, right? It's just, it happens. It's, it's a project, right? No project goes 100% smooth. And then I wrote here, this is the hardest part. So I would say out of all the transaction, this is probably the hardest part is getting it ready to go to the market, right? Because if the seller's, in, if the seller's on the same page and you got the right plan, you crossed all your T's and then you got the property ready and it's ready to go, like all the majority of the work's already done, right? It should be smooth sailing after that, as long as you price it right, the market's, you know, doing what it's doing. But this is probably the grunt of the work, right? Is, is getting it to this point right here. Any questions, guys? Managing the home prep? All right. Yeah, just, just the experience I've had dealing with Enrique, he would just go even for like the staging and the photography. I mean, he'd be the guy there, like fixing the pillows before the photography. Yeah. And, and I think it's important to understand that because if you really take ownership of the listing, yeah, we have the team and we're going to leverage the team as much as possible. But this is your, you're the one getting that commission check, right? Not not the assistant, not the back end. So you've got to really, I, I think it's important to take that ownership to, to an extent of, you know, this is your name. This is, you're, you're the one behind this listing. Right? And yeah. who's going to get the referrals from this listing if it comes up that app? Like who's going to get those referrals if you want? Yeah. You want to make sure all those things are done correctly. Yep. Absolutely. So like uh, the listing that I did do, mm -hmm. uh, there was a problem with the landscaping, and it was something that looked totally dealt with. Yeah. But it wasn't until far after we got there, and I go, they called us, and they actually completed. Um, and then we asked them to come back out, and they didn't. And then we pay them more money to do it, even though like, that's what they promised us. Actually, so do you get things in the written contract of like what you expect from your your all like if you guys don't meet these things in your you're gonna fix it? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. When that's a good question, um, what Andre said is anytime you're hiring a contractor, a landscaper, anybody, a vendor, it needs to be in writing of what the services are, right? It shouldn't be a handshake agreement, um, because if push comes to shove and they don't do their job, you need to be able to go back to like, Hey, this is what we paid you for. You didn't deliver, you know, it was on there. So absolutely. That needs to be in writing. And then here's the thing is 
sellers, right? It's better that you take control over who's doing the work. Like you go with your people that you know, that you can trust, that have a proven track record versus letting the seller try to choose, right? Because nine times out of 10, what does the seller try to do when they choose a contractor? Cheapest, cheapest one, right? Oh, my buddy said he could paint my house for me, right? Or if I just buy the paint, right? Or, or I'm just going to do the uh, landscaping myself, right? Or are you a landscaper? No, All right? Like, and then you come and like, it just looks like crap, right? So this is where you got to sell the services to the, to, to the seller, right? Like, hey, this is why you want to work with me because I have all these people in place and we've tested them out. They're vetted. We know their work is good. It's going to cost you twice as much if you got to, if you pay someone, they don't do a good job. And now we got to go hire our guy now, right? I have a question. If you hire a contractor, would they um, have to be licensed contractor or can they be non-licensed contractor? I think it just depends what type of work you're doing, okay. right? Like if it's just, um, if it's cosmetic work, you know, it's, it's you know, paint and all that stuff. I, I don't think you have to be licensed, right? Like I'm not the city or I don't enforce that. But I would say if you're doing something that's major, like structural, you're knocking down a wall, you're doing a major remodel, you want to make sure it's someone who is licensed or has licensed people. Um, but if you're if they're going to come just clean up the yard for you, right, yeah. I would go more off their track record, make sure you've seen their work done before, make sure the prices are, are right. Yeah. Uh, market and say, oh, it's come later on and look at those models and ask for those things. Yeah, for sure. And we Yeah, we had that even with my listing, right? Where um what the city is doing now is they're uh scouting the MLS and they're seeing when people put remodeled or anything like that and then they're going and looking, did you pull a permit for this, right? And then they're they're busting people for not doing permits on work that should have required a permit. And so they're they even called on my listing, right? Like, hey, it says remodeled we want to come out and inspect the property, right? And we were about to close escrow. But the good thing is we didn't do any work that required permits there. It was like just paint and just landscape. Um, so it wasn't any like anything major. But had we had knocked down walls or reconfigured stuff or done more of a major remodel and then we didn't pull a permit, that can throw a wrench in your wholesale right there, right? So it just depends on what the scope of the work is, um, whether you want to go with a licensed or non-licensed or a handyman or whatever it might be. Uh, okay, cool. Got a few more minutes. We're almost done, guys. Uh, okay, marketing. So your marketing day. Um, so house is ready to go. Now you got to start with the marketing stuff. And I, I consider staging marketing, right? That's going to enhance the look of the home. So let's talk about staging. So when you get a home staged, what staging is supposed to do is staging is supposed to uh, highlight the home, right? It's supposed to enhance the look of the home. It's supposed to allow people to visualize the home you know, on where they would put their furniture, how it would look. It's supposed to, staging also will um, distract buyers from like that big hole in the wall, right? Or like the floors are pretty worn, right? Like they're old hardwood floors, they're all scratched up, but you got a nice rug and a couch. You're not really going to see all that stuff, right? So it does cover up some of the minor defects. But the staging, guys, is not necessarily supposed to be what you like or what you prefer, Right. And so I run into to situations where like some people are like, I don't like the staging. Remember, like you're not the one buying the house. And so I think if my opinion is if the staging is at least, you know, up to like a B level or a B plus level and above, it's going to do the job. Right now, I can see if like stuff was just falling apart, it didn't match, it didn't go together. Um or you don't feel like it tied into the style of the home, anything like that. And then those are things you probably want to go back to your stager to adjust those. But just because like they used yellow and yellow is not your color, like that shouldn't be a reason to not use the stager. That shouldn't be a reason to like have them change everything. Right. Um, it's not like what's your personal taste, because quite frankly, if you have 10 different buyers walk in, they're going to have 10 different opinions on the couch or the colors or the artwork or whatever it might be. Right. So we want it to just look nice and acceptable. And then you also want to take in consideration the price point of the home as well, right? If it's just a average priced home, the staging just needs to look decent. If it's a luxury home, then the staging should probably be a little bit more luxury to tie into that type of property. So you also got to think of who's the, who's the type of buyer that's going to walk in. Um, so that's, that's my bit on staging. 
Uh, I highly recommend staging, um, even if it's partial staging, even if it's just staging, uh, adding to what the seller already has, right? We've done that. But staging is not going to sell a home that has a bunch of issues, right? You can have a nicely staged home, but if the foundation's cracked, that's going to throw away, you know, most of the buyers, right? So staging is also not going to do miracles. It's when everything comes together, that's when you have a really nice market at home. Um, so prepping for media day or pre even prepping for staging, you want to make sure that any work that's being done to the property is already done. And this is the, this is the challenge that we run into is that when we're doing work on a property, everyone's trying to hurry up and get the listing on the market, right? Contractors down to the wire, doing their last minute touch-ups. And then the mistake I see is we're trying to book the stager and the contractor's still not out, right? And then, so what that does is that kind of clogs up the process. Sometimes like we got to do what we got to do if there's like a deadline or there's a specific reason, but you always want to make sure like one guy's out of the way. So then the other guy could come in and like not be disturbed or they don't have to come back in and like move stuff around to finish the work or anything like that. Cause that all that does is just cause delays and more potential for mistakes. Um, so I always want to walk the property. Once the work is done, I want to make sure it's ready to be, uh, to, for staging to go in when the staging goes in, and it's time for photos, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to um, be there with the photographer, right? Or at least I'm going to have a conversation with the photographer. Or if I have a team, I'm going to make sure my team member went out there to double check all the staging. Because here's what happens is your contractor will come back to finish something and then they sit on the couch and then they're like, they put a big dent in the pillows or they move the pillow, right? Or they leave their soda right there, right? Or, or a garbage can, right? Um, you know, someone moved the garbage cans out and now the garbage cans are next to the garage and then your photographer just takes a picture and there's two garbage cans right there. Like those are some of my pet peeves because I'm like, we did all this work to make the property look like super dialed in. And then like they take a nice shot of the living room and the pillow is like thrown on the floor or something. Or the pillow is like all, it's not where it's supposed to be. That's a representation of me, right? Like I take pride in like how my listings look. So I would always go out there and I would double check everything. I would make sure all the pillows are good, the plants. I'd move anything out of the way, put the garbage cans away, um, especially for photos, right? Because photos, it just captures that moment. If something's out of whack, you're going to see it in the photos, right? Um, you know, and then also taking in consideration what features of the home should be highlighted. Remember, if you're the agent, you know more about that home than the photographer, than your admin team, than anybody else, because you walked it, you had the conversations with the seller. So I would go out there, talk to the photographer and say, hey, I want to make sure you get this shot right here. I want to make sure you accentuate the backyard because this is a big selling point, right? Or whatever it might be. Or, hey, there ha it has a guest room downstairs because that could be overlooked if they don't know the property, right? So this is where like, if you're not proactive, things can go wrong. Um, with video, uh, it's great to do video, but keep in mind like video you can have the dopest video, but like not everyone's going to watch your video, right? The video doesn't go on the MLS. The photos are extremely important. Um, videos are honestly going to be more to market yourself. So I highly recommend video, but video, it's one of those things where like, okay, it's on Instagram. You're just kind of scrolling. All right, cool. And if you go back and look at your average watch time, people probably only watch like 10 seconds of the video, right? So even if you have like a three minute video, no one is watching all three minutes of that video. It's very, very rare. So I think you got to just understand that video is great, but it's a marketing piece for you, right? So if you could be in that video and talk, that's better, right? Than just like no one knows who the agent is because now you can use that video on other appointments. You can use that video to market yourself. You can use that video in your email marketing. You can use that video on your listing presentations. You can use that video... Uh, I send videos in my emails when I'm confirming an appointment with the seller, I'll send one of a video that I did where I was in the video. I send that to a potential seller, right? So video is a great way to build marketing collateral for yourself. Is it going to make your home sell? Not really, right? Price condition, location. Those are all the, the market conditions. Those are all things that really make the, the home sell, right? But they look cool. They look sexy, right? So use them for what, what they're for. Um, we've got a couple of minutes, guys, and we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, going to the market, right? So when you're going to go onto the market, you got all the media done, you're ready to go to the market. 
number one question you got to ask yourself is, are you fully ready to go to the market? Right. Because as soon as you list that home on the market, you have to expect that people are going to come see the home that same day. Right. Agents are going to come home. So if you're still got like work that needs to be finished, if the house is still messy, if the house hasn't been cleaned yet, if the stager still has to come back. Right. You're not really ready. So I highly recommend you don't list the home until you're actually ready to accept an offer on the home and start negotiating. Um, that ties into your disclosures and your inspections. Sometimes like we're trying to list the home and the inspections haven't been done yet. This, the homes move fast, right? So if people want to make an offer within the first couple of days of you going live and you're still waiting on your dis inspections or disclosures, like that can uh, jeopardize, you know, how strong of an offer you get. That can jeopardize your contingency periods. So you want to make sure when the home hits the market, I have disclosures ready, inspections ready. All the work has been done. All my T's have been crossed. I's have been dotted. It's ready to like freaking rock, right? And if that means you got to push the list date out one more week, push it out one more week. Because after that, it moves fast. And then people are scrambling, trying to get stuff done. People are stressed out. And it doesn't help anybody at that point. Uh, finalizing the list price. So making sure that before you put the house on the market, you need to meet with the seller and you need to go over the list price again. Because let's say it took two months to get the house ready. And when you met with them, the comps were one thing. And now the comps have changed in between that time, right? So you need to make sure you finalize the list price again. You sit down with them. You walk through it. Um, you set the expectations again. Maybe you need to adjust up. Maybe you need to adjust down. But you want to finalize the list price again. Uh, setting up for a price reduction. So I like to have this conversation already in the beginning before we go, when we go to the market is, Hey, this is the plan. We're going to put it on the market at this certain price, but in three weeks or four weeks, if we don't have any strong activity, then we're going to have to make an adjustment, right? So what you're doing is you're already planning that seat up front that we're going to go into the market at this place, but we're going to adjust if we need to because it's a lot easier to make that adjustment later on if you've already had that conversation up front instead of surprising them with, hey, we got to drop the price now, right? And then now the seller's like, you know, they're mad at you. So why not just have that conversation up front? Um, all your marketing material needs to be ready when you go onto the market. Your flyers, your open house flyers, anything that you need, your sign in front of the house, like any last minute things, you want to make sure those are ready to go so that when it's on the market, you're not scrambling once again. Um, what's the best day to list the house? It's up for debate, honestly. Um, but some people say like listed a few days before your open house. So it looks like the new property, um, people are getting ready for their open houses on the weekend. Um, so then they'll be able to, if it's gets listed, like on a, you know, Wednesday, they know that property just came up. All right. I'm going to add that to my home tour. Sometimes we'll list on a Monday or Tuesday. We have all our flyers ready. We'll go door knock the neighborhood promote the open house. So we push all the traffic to that weekend. So there's no exact science guys, but just kind of use your common sense. Do you have all your stuff ready? And what's your marketing approach leading up to the open houses, right? And with open houses, guys, that's where you want to market your open houses, right? You want to put them on the MLS. You want to make sure they're on the websites, all those different things, but you also want to go out there and knock the neighbors, make sure you're, taking advantage of the opportunity to showcase this listing and potentially pick up other business. All right. We got a couple more slides. You guys with me? I know this is a lot of stuff. Good thing is this is going to be recorded. So I'm just going to go through it anyways. And then later on, if you got to come back and watch it, you can watch it. Uh, managing an active listing, right? So once the listings on the market, it's important that you set expectations for the seller um, you don't want to over promise anything, right? You want to let them know like, Hey, this is a well thought out approach, but we're going to keep you informed of what's going on. And if we need to make adjustments, we're going to make adjustments. Feedback and communication is extremely important when your listings on the market, because the seller is nervous, right? All this work happened. Now the listing goes live. They're like waiting, like what's going to happen with my listing, right? Like what's going to happen? Do we get any offers? How was the open house? So if you're leaving the seller in the dark and you're not talking to them, you're not communi communicating with them, you're just adding to their stress level. The seller should never be hitting you up saying, hey, what's going on? How did it go? You should be hitting them up, right? 
um, any issues that come up, let's say you got some feedback from the open house, like there's a smell coming from like something they need to know right away. Right. Um, because if they don't know, and then later on, that's an issue on why we're not getting the, the activity we want. And then you're trying to now throw that at them later, you're going to look bad. Right. So any issues, you got to address them right away as they're happening, you keep them informed. And then what I recommend, guys, is sending the seller a weekly report and letting them know up front every week you're going to get a report from me on what's happening with your listing. Because as you give them that report, if you need to adjust the price or do anything like that, you have all this ammunition and data to back it up, right? So just sending them an email with like, how many people showed the home this week? What's the feedback, right? You're calling listing agents. What's the feedback that we've been getting? What do people think about the price? What do people think about the condition of the home? How many views have we been getting online from, you know, Zillow, from Redfin, anything like that? Um, yeah. How many downloads of disclosures, things of that sort? It could be a, just a quick little email template. Hey guys, this is your report this week. This is what happened on the home. Um, you know, things look good. We, we're staying the course or, hey, I think we need to talk about what our next move is, right? Based off this information. So just doing that, guys, is going to make a, big, big difference in the experience for the seller. And it's going to show a proactive approach for you, which makes you look like the rock star, right? All right. Title and escrow roles. I think I got two last two slides. Uh, title and escrow. Um, everyone knows how title and escrow works, right? But at the end of the day, like the main things that title and escrow are going to do and, and what you need to be aware of is the statement of information. So there's something that a seller signs where they got to sign this statement of information. They got to put all their information on there. The seller needs to run that through their system to see if any liens, judgments, or anything comes back against that seller. Escrow runs, that. Escrow runs that, right? They run like a, uh, a search on the seller's name. Um, and also on the prelim, you want to make sure you look at the prelim when you first uh, take on the listing in the beginning, because you want to see like how much they owe, Right. Sometimes sellers forget like, oh, yeah, I forgot I took out a loan. Right. <laughs> Do I? Oh, yeah, I forgot I got sued and I got to pay someone once I sell my house. There's a judgment against me. Right. Oh, yeah, I forgot I owe child support and I can't sell my house. Otherwise, I have to pay all this child support and that kills the deal. Right. So that's why you as a listing agent, you need to look over that prelim in the beginning. Right. Look over that whole thing. And even when you're working with a buyer, you should be looking at the prelim as well, because if something pops up for the seller right and they didn't know they may not want to sell it to your buyer anymore same thing with this seller they may they, they may not want to sell if there's something that's going to really jeopardize their profit or anything like that so the statement of information needs to be ran early in the process you need to make sure you look at the prelim and you need to understand can this home be sold without any issues to the title uh any liens anything that we're not aware of is that all factored into how much they're going to walk away with all those different things Right. So when would you do something like this? I did that up front. Right. I did that in the beginning. As soon as we open up escrow, um, we usually send it to escrow. They start opening up the prelim. A lot of times they'll send you the prelim and sometimes you guys just ignore it, right? You guys don't even look at the prelim, All right? So every time I'd get that email, I'd open the prelim and I'd, I'd scan through it really quick. I'd go to the back where it has all the liens and judgments and I've caught some certain things like, hey, this guy's in bankruptcy. Like if he's in bankruptcy, we can't sell unless we have permission from the court. Right. And some uh, rookie agent will not even see that. Get the house ready, get it on the market, get the contractors out there and all this stuff. And then later on, oh, yeah, I forgot I'm in bankruptcy because it happened like five years ago and I'm still making payments. Right. Or it's, in a trust. or it's in a trust. Right. Or, hey, who's this other random person on title? Like, who's John Smith? Like, I've never heard of a John Smith. I thought it was just you and your husband and wife. Oh, yeah, that's my uncle that let us borrow money when we bought the house. Actually, he owns 20 percent of the property. Well, where is he? He lives out of state. Does he know you're selling? Uh, I'll call him, right? Like, dude, he needs to sign. He needs to sign the contract, right? So these are all things that can come up and bite you later on. So statement of information needs to be ran. Prelim, you need to look that over. You need to make verify who's on title and can the home be sold without any issues. Any questions, guys? Last slide. <laughs> yes. Uh, the BK on the last slide, is that bankruptcy? Okay. Bankruptcy. Yeah, you can still sell a home in bankruptcy. It just depends what kind of bankruptcy they're in. I've, I've sold them and it depends. Do you need uh, permission from the court, right? There's all kinds of different things. Are the creditors going to have to be paid off when they sell? So, uh, which, yeah. So you have to find that out. 
But for some sellers, that can make the difference if they want to sell or not, right? If they're like, hey, I'm not going to see any profit. I'm just going to have to pay off all my bills. Nah, I don't want to sell, right? Um, so what could go wrong, right? So this is a list of kind of everything that I've already talked about, but this is kind of just a summarized list. And this is something that you guys should know. You price the home incorrectly, right? You don't price the home right, it's not going to sell, right? It's going to sit on the market, right? So making sure you price it correctly is important. If the home inspections are, you know, you hired some random inspector and they're not good home inspections and they leave out a bunch of stuff, that can come by, come back and bite you. Um, the buyer's financing, right? If the buyer's financing falls through, that can kill your deal. Any legal issues, right? Anything on title that comes and bites you. If you're working with an HOA, you need to make sure the HOA is cooperating, right? That's a whole other entity that is going to dictate if the sale could happen. The buyer changes their mind, right? It happens, right? Like buyer changes their mind. Now they're trying to find a reason to back out. The market is slow, right? So your home's just sitting on the market because the market has slowed down. Doesn't mean it's not going to sell. It just might take longer. And now your seller's getting nervous, right? So that's where you need to, you know, be on top of the market. Poor marketing, right? You did a whack job of marketing that property. You didn't advise the seller, right? And now they're not getting the activity that they want, right? Or you didn't have that tough conversation in the beginning to tell them, hey, we need to paint this house. Otherwise, you're not going to get the best price. And now you're not getting the price they want. And now they blame you, right? Appraisal issues. You're in contract. Appraiser comes out. Something comes up with the appraisal. Either the value comes too low, right? Or either the... Uh, Appraiser identifies something that needs to be repaired. That's happened to us before. Uh, if you have a buyer who has a contingent sale, so let's say you take an offer from a buyer and then their offer is based off them selling their house. Well, now you're, that's a whole nother, there's like a domino effect, right? Yeah. Like your deal needs to go through, but then they got to get in contract to buy this one. You need to make sure like all your T's and I's are, are crossed and dotted. Um, Emotional sellers, I already told you guys about that, right? Making sure you're, you are patient with emotional sellers. Um, emotional sellers will not want to negotiate later down the line if the expectations aren't set correctly, right? They're going to they're gonna make it really hard for you to negotiate. Um, home repairs, right? Any home repairs that need to be done up front that might jeopardize your sale because later on it's going to give the, the buyer leverage to negotiate with you, right? Any contract disputes. Um, happens all the time right like you got an agent who like is trying to like not follow the contract trying to break the rules we have a deal right now where the agent doesn't they're not following the contract right yeah. and that can kill the deal zoning issues that doesn't really happen a lot in our area but there could be some zoning issues where the house is zoned in a certain neighborhood and then later on the lender doesn't want to lend on it because of the zoning right maybe it was zoned commercial or something but it looks like a residential like that one that yeah, you had right that you may be limited on what lender you can go through Buyer wasn't aware of it. Buyer's agent wasn't aware of it. It comes up when it's time to do the appraisal. Um, communicate, uh, market shift, right? The market shifts while you're on the market, right? Like everything's going good. You put the house on the market and all of a sudden like rate go, rates go up and then like there's no buyers no more, right? That can happen. Um, communication issues. You don't communicate uh, efficiently with your seller. Um, you don't let them know what's happening with the property. You don't let them know what's happening with the activity. And then later on, you want to lower the price and you did a bad job at communicating. Now they don't want to work with you. Uh, unqualified buyers. You find out your buyers are unqualified later on, or maybe like you didn't really do a good job of checking their, their pre-approval and calling the lender uh, inspection contingencies. Right. I told you that issue with my listing where they had an inspection contingency. They did their own foundation report, came back at like a hundred grand that killed my deal. Right. Um, closing delays, right? We're trying to close by a certain day, but something's delayed. Either the seller's delayed, either the buyer's delayed. Um, that happens. Agent errors. This happens a lot. Agent errors. Agent makes the mistake of saying something is included with the sale on the home when it wasn't like appliances, right? Hey, appliances are included. Seller says, Hey, I'm not selling the appliances. Now you got a dispute at the end. And now you have to come out of pocket for the appliances or the agent enters the information incorrectly on the MLS. The property is 8,000 square feet. Um, the lot size, they accidentally put 12,000 square feet, right? You're in contract. And then at the end, the buyer's like, dude, I thought it was 12,000 square feet, right? I want you to lower the price now because you made an error. That's happened before. We've actually taken advantage of it and got a discount on the home when that's happened. 
and then tax implications, right? So the sellers were not aware of what they were going to pay in taxes and that kills your deal. There's a bunch of other stuff that can go wrong, but I would say these are like the most, most common ones that you want to avoid. And so by you doing a good job of preparing up front, you can avoid a lot of these issues at the end, right? Questions. It's a lot, right? It's a lot. Okay, so I know it's a lot. Some of you guys are like, yeah, that's a lot of stuff. I don't know if I want to do listings, right? <laughs> <laughs> you're overwhelmed. But I would just say this, look, it is the more you do it, the more you're going to learn, right? You got to start somewhere. And to be a good listing agent, you need to learn this stuff, right? So you need to study it. You need to practice it. You need to uh, research it go on YouTube, ask questions, um, and you will get better and you will figure it out. The more transactions you do with buyers, the more you will learn about this as well, right? So to be a good listing agent, you also got to be a good buyer's agent, right? Because they go hand in hand, right? A lot of the same things. Um, to be a good listing, listing agent, you need to be good at setting expectations with your seller. You need to be good at having the right conversations, even if it's not what they want to hear, but it's what they need to hear. Um, you need to be a good listener. And you need to make sure that you over communicate, over communicate, over communicate, make it a practice where like every Friday I call my sellers with an update. That's just, even if I talk to them on Thursday, I call them on Friday just to tell them nothing's new. Right. But that's a practice. You should do that with all your business. Right. There should be a certain day of the week when you give updates and you, and then you sell that in your appointment. Hey, the way I work is every Friday, you're going to get a call from me between 11 and 12. That's when I do my client updates. Even if we've talked throughout the week. Right stuff like that. Um, and don't try to uh, wing anything, right? Like always go to someone who has done it before, always ask questions, ask me questions, ask someone else in the office um, so you don't get yourself into a situation. Questions, questions, closing questions. Yes, um, I just like being up front, just like what you just said, keeping everything up front and there's no surprises to the seller. Yep. The seller wants someone who's going to lead them to the finish line, right? They don't want someone who's going to sugarcoat. Sugarcoating stuff is a no-no with sellers, right? So it should be a no-no with any clients at yeah. all. But you don't ever want to overpromise stuff, right? Because the seller hired you to take this whole complex process and make it easy for them, right? And to lead them the right way, to advise them the right way, to tell them the truth, right? And that's where trust comes from. Because if you overpromise something and then they end up finding like you kind of blew smoke, like your trust and your credibility is out the window, right? So I would rather tell a seller like, hey, unfortunately, I can't do that. Hey, I, hey, if I can't do that, do you still want to move forward with it, right? Or hey, I don't want to promise you that. It's not likely that we're going to get that price. I'm going to try as hard as I can. But this is more or less where you're at. Does it still make sense for us to move forward? Stuff like that, right? Where it's just like you're just being upfront and honest with people and then they're going to respect you for that because there are agents out there who over promise promise the moon promise this oh, i'm going to sell your house for this much right it's like no agent can guarantee how much a home is going to sell for and in fact you should not make yourself responsible for how much the home is going to sell for because really who determines how much the home's going to sell for the market now can you influence how much the home's going to sell for can you negotiate can you help put them in a position to get more. Absolutely. And that's the way you should sell your services is, Hey, I can't dictate that final number, but I can do all of these things to help position you to reach that final number. Right. Any agent who is guaranteeing you a price, they're lying. Right. And I say that on my listing appointment and then they go, well, no one's ever said that to me. Exactly. That's why you want to work with me. Right. Cause I'm not going to blow smoke up your ass. Cool. All right, guys. That's all I got. Thank you. Is that recording?